All right, we're going to begin reading tonight in Revelation chapter 3, and I do ask that you would pray for me uh, after church. This morning, my head just began to hurt, and the way it usually works for me is I start seeing dots, and then I get a migraine, and so uh, the Lord at this point has spared me. Um, Just pray that as we read and as we study, that would not become a distraction, um, that we would be able to faithfully go through this these six verses together. So with that being said, please pray and let's begin reading in Revelation chapter 3. The Bible says this, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember, then, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. You have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want to ask you a question right quick before we dig in. And I, You don't have to answer out loud, but I want you to answer honestly to yourself. When was the last time you walked outside at night and looked up At the stars. I'm not trying to be cheesy, but I'm just trying to ask you an honest question. When when was the last time you went outside at night and just looked up? Some of us, we just don't don't even think about it. Kids love it. Uh, For me, it's especially sweet in the wintertime when snow is on the ground. I don't know, there's just something about it. You walk outside and you look and it seems like the stars are so close above you. I love to see kids light up and they're like, man, there's so many stars. They look like they're just right there. But did you know, so I was doing some research this past week, even though those stars seem so close, they are trillions of miles away. Trillions of miles away. Stars are so far away from us, astrologers, astronomers, excuse me, have had to come up with this new way to measure how far we are from the stars. We call it a light year. A light year. Now, let me explain what a light year is. I promise there's a point behind this. One light year is the, it equals the distance that light travels in a year. Sounds pretty simple, right? By the way, light travels more than 186,000 miles per second. Imagine 186,000 miles per second for a year. That's one light year. That's more than 6 trillion miles in one year. That's fast, right? So think about this for a second. Just bear with me. All right. If a star 30 light years away from earth exploded and died five years ago. All right, that's a lot. We would not be able to tell that star has exploded for another 25 years. That's how far that star is away from us. That's how long it would take for us to see that light. Does everybody feel small at this point? That's kind of the point. Though a star is no longer in existence, the light from that star would go on shining as if nothing has happened for another 25 years. You know, that's the way many churches today exist. You say, what do you mean, Brother Travis? Many churches today still shine with a light that is reflected from their past past history. That's why whenever you, sometimes you go to churches and they're, they're huge, they're, they have these huge campuses, 
and yet they're dead. But you're not able to see that death until later on. You look at these churches from a distance and you might think that nothing has changed, yet spiritual darkness and sinful and fleshly living, they're really rotting from the inside out. They're exploding. That was exactly what was going on here at Sardis. They had the reputation of being alive, but the Lord said that the church at Sardis was dead. Everything looked good on the outside, but inside, a spiritual cancer caused from sin was beginning to grow and to grow and grow. Why did, why did Jesus say this was a dead church? Because this was a church that was controlled by sin and unbelief, and false doctrine. This church at Sardis was like a tree. He was producing leaves through religion, but there was no fruit. You ever seen a tree like that? Yeah, have you ever planted a fruit tree and it produces, or maybe it's a tomato plant. That's, that's the case for me. You plant it, and you're like, man, I'm finally going to get a tomato. But it just produces leaves. There's no, there's no fruit from it. That was the case for the church at Sardis. And it's the case for many churches today. The lot that they're giving off is just an illusion. All right. It's kind of our introduction, but I want us to dig in and, and really learn about this church. Who wrote this letter to the church at Sardis? Look at verse number one. It says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So, who is it that has the seven spirits? So maybe we should ask another question. What are the seven spirits? The seven spirits here in verse number 1 is a reference to Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 2. It's the fullness of the Spirit. Christ, the one who wrote this letter to the church of Sardis, is the one that contains the fullness of the Spirit. But then he goes on to say, and the seven stars. Well, what does the seven stars represent? Again, it, it shows cross power through the Spirit, but it also shows cross power through the seven stars, which are the elders, those that are over these seven churches. God's rule through godly leaders and godly pastors. So, to summarize, before we go on, who wrote this letter? It was Christ, the one who contains the fullness of the Spirit and who is controlling sovereignly the leaders of these churches. Now, we've studied a lot of churches in the past, but what about this church here at Sardis? What do we, what do we know about it? Well, the church of Sardis is a lot like the church we learned last week at Thyatira. We don't know exactly when it was founded. We assume it was through Paul's preaching ministry in and around Ephesus, according to Acts chapter 19. One thing that we do know about Sardis is one of its members, who was alive during the last part of the second century, his name was Melito. If you go back and you study church history, Melito, a member of this church, wrote the first known commentary on Revelation. Pretty neat. In fact, I, I thought, man, can I get that book? There's you can't. You have to get it translated from other people. Uh, but it's pretty neat. Uh, something else that I want to note about this church is we don't see a lot of persecution happening to this church. Do you know why? Why would the devil fool with persecuting a dead church? There are no danger. You know, that's, that's a pretty good reminder to us today, isn't it? There's a lot of churches that aren't facing persecution or heat from the community. Because they're of no danger. <laughs> Satan sees them of no danger. All right. This is number three on your paper. Let's talk about the actual city of Sardis now. What do we know about this city? Um, it was founded a long, long time ago, 1200 B.C. Uh, so, again, this was founded uh, prior to Christ's incarnation, before he was born of a babe. Um, it's known in history as one of the greatest of the ancient cities. 
Uh, something else that you're going to need to know about this city is it was very wealthy. The people had a lot of money. Well, where did they get their money from? They made their money. They become rich because of gold. Um, gold was taken from a nearby river called the uh, Pactolus River. So they refined gold. That's what the city is known for. In fact, when archaeologists would go and uncover the ruins of Sardis, they found hundreds and hundreds of crucibles. What is a crucible? Right. So, so it's like a, a furnace in order to refine gold or, or precious metals. There was hundreds and hundreds of them found there in this, the ruins of Sardis. Uh, Sardis is also known. They had all this gold. They are some of the very first people that minted coins. Uh, that happened there in Sardis. And something else that we're going to pick up on later on in our, our lesson tonight is Sardis was known for the production of dyed wool. Uh, they claimed to have discovered how to dye wool. Now, geographically, this city, and Mr. Clint's going to uh, hit that slide. So this is where Sardis was at. Uh, you can travel there today. The ancient city was built up on top of these formations that you see in this picture here, which is really, it, it's a positive and a negative. These rocks that you see were slick on the sides. There's only one way in and one way out, which is very good for an ancient city. Uh, when you're going to defend the city, the only withdrawal was in this, <laughs> the city could only expand so much, and then they were going to fall off the cliff. Uh, so they ended up years later building on down at the base of this mountain. Uh, something you need to know about Sardis is be they become overconfident in where they lived, and eventually the city was ransacked, and it sent shockwaves all throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, there's all these sayings about, about Sardis, just how crazy it was to be able to conquer that city. But they become overconfident, and the Lord humbled them. Uh, in AD 17, so this would have been in Christ's lifetime, uh, the city was dis destroyed by an earthquake, and then Emperor Tiberius come in, rebuilt the city for these people, and then they built a temple for him and made Emperor Tiberius the uh, object of their worship. So again, very worldly city. Whenever uh, Revelation was written, you take later on in the first century, Sardis was a very prosperous, rich city, but it was beyond its glory days. It was nothing like how it used to be. Uh, all right. Now that you kind of understand in your mind's eye what the city would have looked like, kind of what was going on behind the scenes, what uh, the church would have had to encounter, let's move on to, to verse number one here. What is the concern here? You know, have you noticed in our other letters about the other churches, Christ usually started out with a commendation. He's going to encourage them about something. He just skips that. <laughs> Christ goes straight to... Um, really kind of a rebuke, I guess you could say. Why is that? Because this church here at Sardis could fool the outside world into making itself look like it was this great big church, it was doing great things for the Lord, but the Lord seen through all that mess. He seen through all the fluff. He knew what was underneath the surface. And so, that's what leads him in verse number one to say, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. The church at Sardis looked much like many churches today. There was no difference between what you've seen on the outside of the church versus what you've seen inside the life of the congregants, of the members of the church. They looked exactly the same. The church was defiled by the, wor the world. Inwardly, the church was decaying, and the church was filled with lost people playing church. It was dead. Now, which leads me to a question in verse number one. 
what is the root cause of spiritual decay? How does a church that is healthy and growing go from that place to becoming spiritually dead? It happens all the time. But what's the root cause? The root cause of spiritual decay is sin. Sounds basic, right? But listen to this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 21 says, The unregenerate man, the un unregenerate people are dead in their trespasses and sin. What leads a church to death? You see, a dead church is full of dead people. <laughs> the reason why churches dry up is because it becomes filled with dead people. There's no spiritual life. The church at Sardis was like a museum full of taxidermied animals in their natural habitat. So you look and you're like, okay, that looks good. Now wait a second. There's no life there. Is everybody tracking with me so far? It looks good, but there is no life. Sin had killed the Sardis church. Now, now that we understand what causes death in the church, which is sin, what are warning signs that the church could be headed in that direction towards death and spiritual decay? I didn't put these on your, uh, on your paper. You don't have to write them down, but these are pretty good indicators that the church is decaying and dying. First indicator is this, when a church is content with what it has done in the past. So they always talk about the glory days. Hey, you remember when we used to do this? Do you remember when we used to knock on doors? Do you remember whenever there used to be children in our nursery? And they're just kind of, those were good times. Do you remember what we used to do? Another indicator that a church is either dead or dying is this. When a church begins to focus on curing social issues rather than the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Never before have we seen so many churches that have turned from the life transforming, not even transforming, giving people new life toward this sort of social justice climate. There are so many hollow, deceptive, worldly philosophies that churches are focusing on today, such as cultural Marxism, critical theory, social justice movement. There's churches that that's the banner that they're waving instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is a spiritual cancer that will grow and grow and grow, and it will kill a church. Another indicator that a church is dying is this. When a church is more concerned about material things rather than spiritual things. Hey, if we can just build this, or if we could just do this, if we could build a bigger building, then we will get more people here. No. That's an, that's an indicator that we've moved our focus away from the eternal things and focusing them on the temporal things. Building expansion will come, but the first primary importance is the spiritual health of the church and reaching the lost. Here's another indicator. A uh, church is dying. When the church becomes more concerned about what men think rather than what God says, they become culturally relevant and politically correct. You know a church is dying when it loses its conviction that every word of the Bible is the word of God Himself. They begin to talk about the Old Testament as being outdated, an allegorical, well, that's not real. That's just a story to teach us a spiritual lesson. And it leads to death. You see, 
this is a good reminder for all of us in this room that just looking at a church from the outside is not a in, good indicator of how healthy a church is. Because a church can have huge attendance. They can have a huge campus and yet still be dead or in the process of dying. It doesn't matter the status of a church in the community. It can still be dead or dying. A church that denies the only source of spiritual life is dead. Now, notice verse number two in your Bibles. Christ says this, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Notice the last part of verse number two. He says this, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Again, this church at Sardis is simply going through the motions. It's what, we've all, all, it's what we've always done. But yet they were unacceptable in God's sight. You know, it's kind of sad when you read the story of the church at Sardis. And for me, it reminded me of an Old Testament story of a man by the name of Samson. You guys remember Samson from the Old Testament? So Samson was a strong man. He did a lot of amazing things. But his life, I mean, it's kind of a sad ending. It's a tragic ending to Samson's story. Listen to this. This is Judges chapter 16, verse number 16. The Bible says Delilah, that's a lady. Everybody say Delilah. Making sure you're still awake. So Delilah pressed Samson daily with her words and urged him. What was she urging him? Delilah wanted to know the source of Samson's strength. That's what she wanted. But then the Bible goes on to say in Judges 16, eventually after his soul was annoyed to death by her constant nagging, Samson told her the truth. So Samson reveals the source of his strength. And then, what does Delilah do? She cuts his hair. He loses his strength. Why did he lose his strength? Please do not say because his hair was gone. Samson lost his strength because of his disobedience to God. Sadly, what happened next was the Philistines come in to capture Samson and not even realizing it, Samson goes out to deal with the Philistines as he's done before. But you know what they did? They captured him, bound him, and they put Samson's eyes out. And this is the sad part in verse number 20, and this is how it relates to us tonight. The Bible says, tragically, Samson did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Samson thought he was as strong as he'd ever been. But because of Samson's disobedience to the Lord, his strength had left. The same is true with so many churches today. They think, well, I'm just as strong as I've ever been. But because they've been... Because they are flirting with the world, it's given birth to spiritual decay. So what happened to Samson? His power was gone. He was imprisoned. He was blinded. He was humiliated and then eventually died. That's what happens to, to churches as well. They become blinded, humiliated, and then finally die. All right, let's move on to our next point, number five, the commendation. Verse number four. Some of you are saying, well, what about, what about verse number three? We're going to get to it. Look at verse four. It says, yet you, you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So in the midst of this dead church full of unregenerate people, people that are lost, who's never, ever been changed, there were still a few faithful people. Imagine the church of Sardis like a desert, and there's just a few flowers scattered in the midst of this desert. That's how, that was the makeup of this church. 
But if you'll notice here, in verse number 4, talking about those few names, there was not enough of the faithful remnant to change Christ's overall evaluation of this church. It's still dead. Now, God hadn't forgotten about the faithful people, and He never does. There's a lot of churches, and, and let's be honest tonight, there's a lot of churches who began well, and over time, uh, the, the temptation of sin crept into the church. It began feel, being filled with unregenerate church members, people that are lost, but their name's on the roll. And it's dying. Yet still, in those churches, there's still a faithful few really saved people. God doesn't forget about them. In fact, let's hold our place in Revelation and turn to Romans chapter number 11. God doesn't forget about the remnant. Romans chapter 11, verse number 1 says, I ask then, has God rejected His people? By no means, for, I'm a, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. Do you not know what the Scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Again, God has a remnant, and God had a remnant even in this dead church at Sardis. Now, back to Revelation chapter 3. How is this remnant, these faithful few within this dead church, how does Christ describe them? In verse number 4, He says, People who have not sold their garments. I looked up the word sold. I should know what it means. <laughs> it's, it's probably what you're thinking sold means. There's plenty of sold garments around our house. Um, that was a joke, by the way. A sold garment means one that is sold <laughs> or stained or polluted and defiled. These people, going back to the context, the reason why I share all this stuff with you is to bring out the flavor in the verse. These people had experienced the industry of wool of dying wool. So whenever we get to this word in the original Greek, uh, amalion, which means to stain or to die, oh yeah, we know what it means. These people haven't dyed their garments. They haven't stained their garments. It goes on to say, and to describe in verse number 4, people who have not sold, and it says their garments. Garments here symbolizes their character. It doesn't necessarily mean they always wore a bib when they ate. What it means there is they've not sold their character. They're living a life above reproach. They've not defiled or polluted themselves internally. They were pure. In fact, the Bible goes on to say this in verse number 4, and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. So as they walked here on earth, as they sought to live blameless life, holy unto the Lord, eventually the Christ would replace their humanly garments with divinely pure ones. So in verse 4, talking about garments, he says, they will walk with me in white. You know, there's promises in Scripture. We're, we hear about these promised white garments that believers are supposed to have in different places. Uh, these white garments are wore by Christ Himself in Matthew chapter 17, verse number 2. They're also wore by the holy angels in Matthew 28, verse number 3. Now here in this verse, verse number 4, Christ is promising 
the faithful people within the churches, the church of Sardis, that they will be given perfect holiness and purity to wear in the future. I want to explain that more with our next point. Number six, notice the command. So verses two through three, we haven't dealt with those yet. Did you notice that? We skipped it. Nobody called me out. Thank you. We're going to get to it. Verses 2 and 3 are specifically addressed to the faithful people in the church. Why doesn't Christ address the dead people? They're dead. They cannot hear. There's no point in talking to them. So in verses 2 through 3, and this is helpful for us tonight, or possibly a sister church that's listening, Christ lays out five steps to spiritual restoration. So maybe you know somebody that is in the context of a dead church. They're like, what do we do? Our church is dying. Well, here, this is what Christ lays out for them. This is, we can begin with verse number two. This is to wake up. The first step in spiritual restoration is waking up. You see, they couldn't, the people in this church, seeing all the wrong and the sin and the immorality all around them, they couldn't just go with the flow anymore. They had to reverse the flow. The things that they had been doing had gotten them to where they were now. They couldn't just sit back. They need to evaluate the situation. Hey, what's wrong? And then they needed to get involved in changing things, confronting sin and making a difference. You know, there's a lot of people in local churches that they know what's going on is around, but they're like, well, I, who am I? <laughs> what can I do about it? I can just live my life faithfully. I can't control these people around us. You, you know, last week we talked about Matthew 18 and confronting sin. One of the first instructions Christ gives to the church, sin in the church has to be dealt with or we cannot expect the world to listen to us if we're doing the same things that they are doing. So again, first step is to wake up from their spiritual slumber. The second thing that they needed to do, according to verse number two, was to strengthen what remains and is about to die. Now some of your translations may say this, and strengthen things. Uh, I just read out of the ESV, and it renders strength in what remains. The point is this. It's a neuter noun in the Greek. It doesn't mean to strengthen people. He's not talking about people here. He's talking about you need to strengthen spiritual realities. So what he's saying is those who are spiritual in the church of Sardis needed to fan the embers within the church of good, true doctrine in order that it may, it may grow into a burning flame within the church. So the good things, the true doctrine, that's what they needed to strengthen. Those remaining graces. Number three, the third step in spiritual restoration in a dying church is this. They needed to remember what they had received and heard. It says this in verse 3. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. One of the reasons why churches die is because they veered so far off from God's standard and God's calling within a local church. The main component of, of revival, personal and corporate, is getting back to the Word. You remember King Josiah, do you remember him in the Old Testament? When they found the Word and he had it read, what happened? Revival. The step, the first step in revival is the Word. And then that brings about repentance. Churches that want to get back on track have to get back to this Word. 66 books in which God's given, which is completely sufficient for all things. This is enough. You notice there has been an uptick and a trend in many churches where people are getting back to the Word. And you know what's happening? People are waking up. They're growing spiritually. They're accepting the call 
to leadership within their family. When you get back to the Word, God brings about spiritual health. He begins to pump it into the veins of the church and you see life. Spiritual life. So they needed to get back and remember the truths of God's Word. What we have to remember is this is a long time ago. But by this time, by the time this was written by John, Paul's letters were already in circulation. So they had, they had faithful teaching to remember. So they needed to reaffirm their belief in the truth about Christ, about sin, about salvation, and sanctification. That was the basis for renewal and revival. All right, so after, notice in verse number Go back to verse number 3. It says, Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it. And then what's the next step? The Bible says to repent. You see, biblical teaching is that first step. But biblical teaching, which is not connected to biblical living, will not produce change. There has to be a connection between this book and the totality of our life. You can read the Bible all you want, but if you don't connect it to practical living, nothing's going to happen. So after, well, I'm already ahead of myself. Number five, they needed to repent. So, and part of that connection that takes place is repentance. They needed to repent for what they had done wrong, and repentance means a change of direction. It was someone else that was in charge from that point forward. And what we have here is a, a very clear-cut prescription for spiritual revival within the local church. When these five steps are carried out faithfully, it will produce revival within a local church. It will. But what happens here is if the church at Sardis did not take the medicine that Christ gave them, it would bring about consequences. Where do we see that? Look at verse 3. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. So this threat that we see is not the second coming of Christ. It, he's saying that the Lord would come and destroy the church at Sardis if they did not repent and if there was no revival. All right, number 7, the council. Look at verse number 5. So what we're about to read is a promise for those who do remain faithful, who hear the call of Christ, who seek to repent, who seek the Word, and, and seek to do things according to what the Bible says. Verse 5, The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. You see that again? He says, And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So the reward for those who participate in the revival, we have this promise of white garments. Well, in the ancient world, when did they use white garments? Let's think for just a second. Even today, white garments are many times used in a marriage, especially in ancient times. But even today, the bride wears white. Christ promises us white garments. Why? Because of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're, there's a wedding that we're going to. It's going to take place. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. We're promised as white garments, but something else. White garments were also used for victors within a battle. We're promised white garments. Why? Because the victory has already been won. And we're able, we talked about this this morning, to celebrate in Christ's victory over sin, death, and Satan. So all those things are true. The marriage, uh, the victors. But just looking at the big picture from 30,000 feet is this. The main reason for the believer's garments here is because the white garments represented purity and represented holiness. And fill in your blank. Christ promises to clothe Christians in eternal purity and holiness. 
It's a good promise for those that faithfully persevere for what? 60, 70, 80, possibly 90 years to be clothed in purity and holiness. But notice, it doesn't stop there. But there's more. Look at verse number 5. It says, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Now, we've got to talk about this for a second. There's a lot of guys skip over this. I want to deal with it briefly, but I think we can do it in a clear way. Some folks, after reading verse number 5, wrongly assume that their name can be erased from the book of life they turn this promise into a threat. And then some people will take this verse, and they'll take another verse from the Old Testament, Exodus 32, verse number 33, and they say that God may remove someone's name from the book of life. Let me just read that verse to you, and then I'll explain it. So the Lord tells Moses that whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Some people say, wait, is there a contradiction in Revelation and Exodus 32? And to that I say, there is no contradiction. The book that's referred to in Exodus 32, verse number 33, is not the book of life that's described here in Revelation. That's also described in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 3. Instead, it refers to the book of the living the record of those who are alive. So the threat then is not eternal damnation, but physical death. Did that make any sense? (laughs) There's two two books. Um, Here's the encouragement for those that possibly in the the past have been uh, taught wrongly that your name can be erased from the book, that you can lose your salvation. There's a lot of people that have taught, have taught that wrongly in the past. Listen to this. The promise for us is Christ, the King of Heaven, has promised never to erase a Christian's name from the roll of those whose names were, this is chapter 13, verse number 8, written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. So you can... To use this verse and the verse in Exodus 32 to say, hey, your name can be erased, you can lose your salvation, is not contextually fair. You're not, you're pulling verses out of context. You're doing what we call isogesis. You're taking an idea and placing it on the Bible instead of exegesis, allowing the Scripture to speak for itself. Look at verse number 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Matthew 10, 32, for those that may still be doubting, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Scripture teaches us that the salvation of true Christians is eternally secure. It can be taken away. I'm not going to go there, but you might want to write down, if you struggle with maybe false teaching from the past about losing your salvation, you might want to read Romans chapter 8, verse 28 through 39. It might be a helpful place to camp out. All right, so how does the letter end? It ends the same way the others do. It says in verse 6, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so what's our, what's our application tonight as we land the plane? As we read this passage, we're reminded that not only t- the church at Sardis, but everyone who has an ear to hear needs to stop playing church and stop being spiritual zombies. They're just, they're just kind of there because of Christ's coming judgment. This is also a reminder to apathetic believers who just kind of go to church, but they're not even really involved in church, that they need to get involved. What is the church teaching? Is this church spiritually healthy? Um, 
And it's also a call to those who are not in a spiritually healthy church to be involved in a spiritually healthy church. There are some churches that are just need to have Ichabod written on the sign because the glory of God has left. And there's people that still go and go through these religious motions, but it's, it's dead. They're the only one there that cares about advancing the kingdom of Christ. You need to find a healthy church and get involved and stop wasting their life. Last application before we conclude is this. The faithful few that found themselves in the church of Sardis could take comfort knowing their salvation was eternally secure. There are a lot of people that th there's not an option to go to a different church. There's a, there's a promise for the remnant. My last question was this. As I was finishing my study this past week, what happened to the church of Sardis? Did they hear Christ's word? Did they turn? Did they repent? Did they experience revival? Remember the guy I told you that uh, wrote that commentary on Revelation? Uh, Melito, I think was his name. Uh, he wrote later on that they experienced revival to a degree, but the vast majority just kept on doing what they had always done. And eventually it died. Christ has not returned, so that means it's not too late for some struggling churches that are experiencing symptoms of spiritual decay. And I'm thankful. And let me, let me tell you why I'm thankful. I've seen a lot of churches, especially here recently, that a lot of people would have written off, like, they're dead. <laughs> Just plan another one. But I've seen how the Lord comes in, and whenever they go back to the Word, whenever they're faithful to the Word, the Lord brings about revival within in the individual's life as individuals day by day are reading the Word and living. They're faithful to biblical teaching. They're faithful to biblical living. Man, there's, there is hope. There's a lot of churches that are dying but the hope is this, to get back to the Word. And whenever the Word is faithfully preached, it brings about conviction and the opportunity for people to, to repent. So that's my hope, that we collectively will pray that the Lord will expose areas in Raymond that were showing symptoms of spiritual decay, and that we would confront those issues and move on towards spiritual health. But we'd also look at sister churches that are, are in desperate situations that need help and encourage them to get back to the book. All right, I want to pray for us.